Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Y'all breathing? So what's, what's, what's the instruction? There we go. I welcome you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And before you start, I'm not wearing red. I told everybody else it's Pentecost Sunday, you know, wear red. And uh, I realized that, um, that I don't have any red in my closet. So it was a bad instruction apparently on my end, but Mr. Burr, thank you. As he, I have been, yellow is the hotter part of the flame. I, that's not true, blue's the hottest, but anyway, right? So yeah, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> anyway, welcome to worship. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the morning you've given to us for, and for the chance to worship you. We thank you for the joy of our salvation and the joy of your spirit here with us this morning. And on this Pentecost Sunday, O oh God, send your spirit upon us afresh that we might know you, that we might worship you, that we might honor you, that we might do as you've instructed, that we might worship you this morning in both spirit and truth. We love you. We honor you. We worship you and you alone. Have your way with us, O oh God. In the name of the Father. remain standing. Good morning. good morning. I add my welcome to our preachers. It's good to see you here this morning. And if you are wearing red, and many of you are out there, if you've been watching softball, it might be appropriate for some other reasons. <laughs> and if you're wearing orange, Hardy's here somewhere, I know. It's also appropriate if you're watching softball right now. So got to have some fun with earthly things too, right? A little bit. Would you join with me in our statement of praise, please? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You know, when you get to my age, you worry about words leaving you at the wrong moments, and you worry about screens that you're depending on sometimes, because humans operate those things too, and besides that, they're machines. <laughs> they don't always work. So, Would you join me in prayer, please, this morning? Dear Lord, thank you for being the wonderful God you are. This morning, Lord, Sharon and I have been blessed to have family home with us. Our refrigerator is now decorated with dinosaurs and other things that are held there by magnets. Thank you for family. Thank you for being our father and the perfect example of what a father should be because you are perfect in every way. Something that we can never match, but that we certainly should aspire to. Thank you for the rain that refreshes today. And Lord, we, uh, as we worship you today here in these walls, we implore your presence with us. We ask you to be in our hearts and our minds. We ask you to be in every word that our pastor speaks, that it might bring the message that you intend to all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I would remind you that the offering plates are at the back of the church. Use them if you will.
So we're going to sing another hymn. This one is number 465, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. Would you stand and join? Thank you, and you may be seated. There's a great truth in that last line of that hymn that it seems contradictory, but it's so true, that we can, through the Spirit, be both firmly bound and truly free. You, that, that, that one, stop and think about that one, because it's one of the keys to the Christian life. Great, great word from that hymn. Not one that we sing very often, but great truth in that, in that hymn. So... It had been a couple of crazy months for the disciples. It had been only about eight weeks, less than 60 days, since the disciples had traveled up the road from Jericho with Jesus after he had set his face towards Jerusalem. Only 60 days. They had seen him welcomed as a king as he traveled down the Mount of Olives on what we now call Palm Sunday. They had watched him turn over the tables of the money changers and been with him as the tensions in Jerusalem mounted. They had celebrated the strange Passover with him that we now call the Lord's Supper. They had fallen asleep while he prayed and Judah schemed. They had seen him arrested, beaten, tried, bounced between the powers of Rome and Israel, and finally crucified. They had run and hid until Sunday morning brought an astounding report. Then they saw him, and they touched him for themselves. They'd gone to Galilee, where they saw him more. And then, just ten days prior, they had seen him lifted into the clouds and seated at the right hand of the Father. But not before he had promised them that if they would wait and pray, the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon them with power. All of this in just two months, less than 60 days. Has anyone ever experienced a more tumultuous, consequential couple of months than these disciples had just experienced? But they were not yet done, of course. For they didn't have to wait long for that last promise to be fulfilled. On the day of Pentecost, literally the 50th day, one more unbelievable event was added to their consequential 60 days. Listen now to the word of God, Acts 2. I'll read the first four verses, then again verses 12 and 13. This is what God's word says. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven the, there, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. All were amazed and perplexed. No kidding, right? For who had ever seen anything like this? First, there was a strange sound, like the sound of a violent rushing wind. But there doesn't seem to have actually been any rushing violent wind, just the sound of it. Then there were tongues of fire, or at least what looked like fire. It certainly wasn't any normal fire because it divided itself And it came to rest on each disciple, and yet nothing and no one was burned. Are you amazed and perplexed yet? Well, if not, there was more. Because as soon as these tongues of fire rested on each of them, they began speaking in new tongues, languages they did not and could not know since they were simple men from Galilee. So in the middle of this clear blue morning came the sound of a violent rushing wind with no wind, came a fire that behaved on its own accord and didn't consume that upon which it rested, and came the clear, fluent praising of God in languages that the men could not have ever known, much less be fluent in. Even given all the crazy that they have experienced in the last two months, this was a step further. This is something astounding. Is it any wonder that those watching the spectacle were amazed and perplexed? And with such an event, someone in the crowd finally asks the logical question. What does this mean? What does this mean? And that is really the question, isn't it? What does this mean? Now, somebody tosses out the idea that they just, you know, been going after it a little bit early that morning. But, um, but that's not a serious you know, answer to what they had just experienced. So that just gets tossed aside. So what does this mean? Is it a strange meteorological phenomenon? Is it some rare natural event? Well, it certainly wasn't one that anybody else had ever seen before. Well, if it's not that, is it a supernatural event? If so, what kind? A prophecy? A warning? A fulfillment? A judgment? And what kind of supernatural being did this supernatural event? Was it one of the Roman gods? Was it the devil? Or was it from Yahweh? And if it was from Yahweh, their God, what was he doing? What does this mean? Well, Peter, of all people, Peter, Peter has the answer. And what it meant was what comes next in the scripture. What it meant was this. This is again Acts 2, picking it up at verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. 
blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What did it mean? Well, the answer to that question was a world changer. What did it mean? This was truly an act of God. This was the fulfillment of the prophecy given to Joel centuries earlier. It was the announcement that a new era had dawned upon the earth. The last days, the days longed for and hoped for, were no longer a future promise, no longer a faint promise, but they were actually now here. The days when the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out on all flesh, on all flesh, were upon us. Young, old, male, female, slave, free. All flesh would receive the Spirit of the living God. The days of prophecy, the days of visions, the days of dreams... That day was now this day. That day was today. There was no longer a waiting for the Messiah to come. The Messiah had come. And the Messiah had come and accomplished all that he had set out to do. And all that was left was to eagerly, eagerly await his return on the Lord's great and glorious day. What did this mean? It meant that the world had been forever changed. The last days were upon them. The Spirit of God was forever with His people. Yahweh had done a wonderful new thing. This is what it meant. And maybe the most important thing that it meant was what we read in verse 21. That now... Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There are no qualifiers here. No, every Jew who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. No, every righteous person who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who will be saved? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, every man, woman, and child who humbles themselves, who admits their needs, who confesses their inadequacy, who calls on God to save them, all will be saved. All who turn to God, not one will be turned away. In these last days, God has poured out his spirit on all flesh that the spirit might return all flesh to the spirit of God. As he had promised while on earth, now that Christ has been lifted up, he is indeed drawing all people to himself through his spirit. What does this mean? It means that salvation has come in the person of Jesus Christ, and all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what it meant then is what it means Today, we are still in these last days. We are still in the days between the Lord's ascension in the clouds and his return on the same. The Lord is still pouring out his spirit on all flesh, on all flesh. As it was, it still is young and old, male and female, slave and free. All flesh can still receive the spirit of the living God. The days of prophecy, the days of visions, the days of dreams, those days are these days. The Lord God is with his people through his spirit. And as Ephesians 3 says, glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. 
we may no longer have the sound of a mighty rushing wind in the room. We may no longer have tongues of fire visible for all. But the wind of the Spirit still blows, and the fire of the Spirit still burns. And today, right now, right here, what this means is this. God's Spirit is drawing us to Christ. God's Spirit is leading us to confess Him as Lord and Savior. God's Spirit is changing our hearts. God's Spirit is guiding our steps. God's Spirit is comforting our griefs. God's Spirit is healing our wounds. God's Spirit is strengthening our spines. God's Spirit is teaching us His truth. God's Spirit is reminding us of all that Jesus said. God's Spirit is making us fruitful. God's Spirit is making us faithful. God's Spirit is building up the body of Christ, which is the church. God's Spirit is leading us in all righteousness. God's Spirit is giving us everything we need to see us through this day and every day so that on that day, we can rejoice when we see the Lord face to face. What does this mean? Well, have you ever had, like the disciples, one of those days, weeks, months, where it was just crazy as can be and you can't believe all the things that happened? Well, what it means is that in every day, the good, the bad, the crazy, the sane, and every day in between. God's Spirit is with you and with me and with all who will call on the name of the Lord. What does this mean? The wind still blows and the fire still burns. So what this means is it means everything. It means that God is with you and God is with me. And it means that there is no person on the face of this earth that is too far gone for God to find. Not a one. The Spirit of God searches us out. The Spirit of God fills us up. The Spirit of God transforms Formed lives then has been transforming lives through the centuries and will transform lives today and tomorrow and every day until Christ comes again. That's what Pentecost means. That the spirit of the living God is with us. So we come to the table on this Pentecost Sunday. And all of this starts coming together, does it not? That he came to us, lived among us, lived the only perfect life that could ever be lived, died for our sins, ascends into heaven where he has all authority and power and sends the spirit upon us that we might know him, grow in him, and become one with him. And he returns us over and over and over again to his table so that that whole story can be told to us that we can be reminded of it, and that we might experience it afresh and anew, week after week after week. So we come to this, his table, on this Pentecost Sunday, recognizing that God is here with us in the bread, in the cup, and in each and every soul who would receive him.
So Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, saying, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, and it's a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In a timing that only God could know, he knew when to send his son to die for our sins. And he knew when to send his spirit that we might be filled with his own life, with his own spirit, that we might become like him, that Christ would come for us, that we might become like him. And so God, knowing what only God could do, sent his spirit upon us to draw us always closer to himself and to reveal to us over and over again the truth of his son, Jesus Christ. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took a cup. He lifted it and blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of a new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with you, make us one with each other, and make us one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes at last and we feast together in final victory at his final at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there's one loaf, you and I can only be one people, one loaf, one Lord, one body broken, one church. And this cup from which we drink the cup of his salvation, our salvation, 
and his sacrifice, the cup of his suffering and our rejoicing, the blood of Christ, the salvation of the world. In our church, you don't need to be a member of this church to receive communion. Our understanding is that while we don't come to the table lightly, uh, we do come to the, the table freely. Meaning that if you would like to draw closer to Christ, that in your own life you would like to follow him, to be more like him, to let his spirit work in you and change you and mold you and work you more and more into his image. If you want to be closer to Christ, this table is for you. If you'd like to be like him, you're always welcome to, be, to, to dine with him. Where you've been, what you're a member of or not a member of, that's not the issue. Christ is the issue. If you have no desire to become closer to Christ, eh, go by, you, or, or, you, know, you can stay where you're at. That's fine. Nobody's going to judge you. That's, I'm serious about that. Nobody will judge you if you don't feel like this is the place for you this morning. But if you want to come, you are always welcome at Christ's table. Those who are going to help me serve this morning, if, uh, if you could uh, come and, and get in place and, uh, while they're coming, just if you've never been here before, the way we're, we're doing communion this morning is uh, we'll have uh, ushers that will just kind of let us go from, from front to back, and, and that just kind of keeps things from ha having to, to get too out of, out of order. And uh, when you come, we'll, we'll receive, a, uh, we'll give you a piece of the bread, and we'll let you uh, take a cup uh, as well. And you can come and take that, and then when you want to, uh, if you want to stop and, and pray at one of the kneeling rails, or the altar rails afterwards, you are always welcome to do that, and you can stay there as long as you need to, to do whatever business you and God need to do together. You're always welcome to stop and, and pray there together. If you have trouble um, uh, with, with mobility, we'll be more than glad to, to, to bring uh, the, the, the elements to you. And if you have uh, issues with gluten, we also have a, a, a gluten-free uh, wafer that we, we offer as well. So as many people as possible... Uh, are welcome to come to the table and, and able to come. So, with that invitation, the Lord's table is set, and I invite each of you now to come. join as we sing. Oh, how could it be that my God would welcome me into this mystery? Get around behind you here. Say, take this bread, take this wine, now the simple made divine for any to By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace you are making us faithful, Lord we remember you, and remember
destroy. Dying to destroy doctor. Rising to restore God. Lord, Lord Jesus, come in glory. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Lord Jesus, come in glory. We're going to just pray for a minute, and then we'll be singing this one or two more times. Lord, we thank you that you send your Holy Spirit to us, that we are not alone, that we are with you, that your presence is inside each of us as we have surrendered our lives to you. Lord, that your spirit is among us, binding us together, providing the unity that you ask for us, providing that holy communion as your spirit meets your spirit in the people around us. Lord, we, pr we thank you that your spirit is present in this room and that we're not just here because of some old stories, but we're here because of the living reality of your presence with us through your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Would you guys stand as you're able and then acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit here in you and among us together in this place. Here we go. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. Brush of angels' wings. 
sing it yeah. one last time. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his Amen and amen. I'm going to go have you, have you go ahead and be seated real quickly. One of the things that if we were to read on in Acts 2 is after the Spirit is poured out upon the people and Peter gives a, I just read a part of his, his, his message, his sermon, what happens next to the, in the church? People are added to the church, 5,000 in that first day. And so it's very wonderful and appropriate on Pentecost Sunday that we get to bring a, uh, new members into our church. So, uh, uh, Cheryl and Phil, uh, you, all, you all know Cheryl and Phil. They've been around here for a little while. Uh, and, uh, and Cheryl and Phil both do a ton of work around this place. And have been just, uh, there's such a blessing here in this church, as many of you guys already know. Now, this is going to be a little odd because Phil is not going to join the church. And Phil is not going to join the church because Phil can't join the church. Do you know why? Because he's, or he's ordained clergy. Uh, Phil is a United Methodist pastor, and when we become ordained, when the bishop lays hands on us, he, we're ordained. And then the next thing we do is we take vows to become members of the annual conference in the Methodist Church. That's how it works. So Phil's membership is in another church. It's in the annual conference, and as is mine and, and, and the other clergy that, that go to this church. So that, with that, that's a long story saying Phil ain't joining. <laughs> but Cheryl is. Uh, because uh, as clergy spouse, believe it or not, she does not take the same vows that he did. <laughs> Sometimes it eh, feels that way, but in, indeed not. <laughs> so, uh, so, so Cheryl, here, here's, there, there's some things that I, I, I baptized. Yeah. Um, the, have you been, no, no, you know what you're doing with the church, you know Jesus, all that kind of, I'm pretty sure you do. But we're always going to ask that question of somebody when they join the church. So I ask you the basic question of the church, or the basic question of faith, is do you believe in God and you trust, do you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. That, of course, joins us to the church. It's the most important membership we have. C Christ then asks us to live out our faith in a particular community. And then that is the, the, the commitment to a particular church. So we ask you the follow-up question to that then is, Will you serve and love this church and be loyal to it through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Will you do that? Yes. All right. You will do that, Phil. You'll do it anyway, even though if you don't have to promise. Yeah. And, uh, and so you, again, know how this works, right? This is covenant. So covenant is two-sided. They, uh, they come to make this promise to the church that they will live out their faith here. The church as a whole then makes a promise back to them that you will support them and help them grow and, and, and lead them closer to Christ and support them in hard times and celebrate with them in good times and simply be the body of Christ for them. So will you do that? Yes. All right. Well, then that's a deal. Cheryl? Thank you. We're, first of all, again, so, so much for you guys do around here. This, the table every week Cheryl works on, Phil's working on the sound and the video for us every week. Thank you guys for your service of this church. And it's a joy to have you officially as, as members here in the church. So give them a hand, would you please? <laughs> all right. So uh, looking ahead to, um, to, to things that we, as, as, as the week uh, 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 follows up before us. We, um, I asked you last week about faith promise. And um, faith promise, we were, at, we, we were getting close to our goal. We had set the goal high this year at 44400 This is for your, if you're new here. This money goes entirely to our church's missions uh, things we do, our missionaries we support, and the missions that we do here locally and abroad. And we had, uh, we had, we had felt God had, had asked us to, to set the bar high this year. So we set it at $44,400. You guys exceeded that. 
Uh, and the faith promise this year has been is at 46,840 as of this morning. So, yeah. So thank you for your faith and thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for trusting in God and thank you for expressing that in, in real tangible terms. Good work is going to get done because of this. Um, our pop-up uh, on the 10th, uh, it, we, were we were supposed to have s'mores last Wednesday down at the lake. It was really wet. <laughs> so we're trying it again. Uh, this is a, the, what we're calling our summer pop-ups. It's just for everybody in the church, uh, all ages, all groups. We're just getting together to have some fellowship and some fun to get to know each other better. So our next one is down here at the Lake Overholzer Boathouse area, uh, just down here and to the south. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll do s'mores and hang out, and it'll be fun this Wednesday the 10th. All right? That's going on. Um, we have things. Our, our CDO is getting started again. We have, um, so pray for them. We have numerous of our youth and our children at camp this week. Please be praying for them, for their camp experience, that God moves in their lives, and also for safety there and back. So uh, m make sure you, you include our, our, our children, our youth especially, in your prayers this week. All right, if I missed anything, all right, then let's stand up. The Spirit of God is with us and in us. The Spirit of God is an unexhaustible resource. Open yourself to God's Spirit, not just on Sunday morning, but every day. God freely gives His Spirit and generously gives His Spirit if we'll just ask. So, in God's power, leave this place. In God's power, go out into the world. And in God's power through his spirit, live as witnesses for Jesus Christ wherever you go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in the power of the Spirit.